day of Elul, corresponding to the second day of September 2021. Today's special breakfast and class, graciously sponsored by my family and I, Le'ilu Nishmat, uh, my father, uh, David Ben Esther, uh, that today is his Askara, his Ereyat. He was Niftar 21 years ago, in the year 2000. Uh, uh, but Baruch Hashem, uh, we had a great life. He had a great life, I like to say, in many, many levels. Uh, spiritual, physical, uh, emotional, and obviously spiritual. Although he grew up very traditional until he arrived to the holy city of Argentina, of Buenos Aires. I'm sorry, Uruguay. I'm sorry, Mexico. I'm sorry, Brazil. Colombia is not a joke. It is true. Although, I must be honest with you, when they left Egypt, and they left Egypt empty-handed. Their first destination was Montevideo, Uruguay. They had a huge Sephardic uh, community back then in the day, and uh, in which many of the landsmen of my grandparents, originally from Turkey, from my father's side, settled in Uruguay. And that is the visas that they got to become residents of Uruguay as I told you the story in the past. Eventually, my father, a few years later, moved to Buenos Aires. That's where he became exposed to the Syrian community, Syrian world, and eventually he marries my mother, that back then in the day there was an issue if they were allowed to get married because she was from Syria yeah. and he was from Egypt, and back then in the day was considered to a certain extent assimilation. God forbid, in a more serious note, Shalom, but this was the mindset, right? You remember that? I remember as a child that between Halab and Sham, between Damascus and Aleppo, there was also a, a machloket if they were allowed to get married. But putting all jokes aside, eh, kulam ahubim, kulam berurim, kulam giborim, kulam kedoshim. As long as eh, we're dealing with kosher people, the passport and the background really it's secondary. What year did he leave? He left Egypt, I think, 1950. 1949, 1950, correct. Anyways, um, additionally, additionally, my father, as I said before, did not grow up in a yeshiva setting like I did, but he was very traditional, great examples of parents and even grandparents. But one thing that he had, he had, Emunat Hachamim. He had Temimut and Emunat Hachamim. Whatever the Hachamim will say, he will follow. There was no questions. And this is Baruch Hashem, the way many people back in the day, this is how they acted. They following the first, the state, the famous statement of the great Kedushat Levi. And even when he came to make decisions, and I'm not going to be repetitive, but the audience that comes here every day remembers many stories that I told you through my life, how decisions even made about me as a teenager. It was based on what the rabbis said. And what the rabbis said, we accepted. We said, Amen, even though that perhaps at that moment we did not see the clarity of that. And that's something that is also in my uh, DNA and that's why I'm connected to Hachamim because I saw my father, Allah Shalom, connected to Hachamim as well. My father was a giver, a giver, a giver. I learned from him how to give. You see me, I go up to the Sefer, I give. You yeah. gotta see, part of my paycheck stays in the synagogue. Automatic. I'm not being uh, arrogant about it. I'm telling you where I learned it from. This is what I saw. I saw people came home, people came to the office, people came to the knees. I'll take the opportunity to tell a story that happened maybe 35 years ago, or 40 years ago even. The story happened in Sao Paulo, Brazil. My brother reminded me of the story yesterday because to my surprise, whatever happened 30 some years ago is still alive today. So I'm gonna tell you quickly the story, 
and then we learn uh, some ideas of the Benishai, that my father and the Benishai were friends from childhood, more or less, spiritually relaxed. <laughs> the Benishai <laughs> passed away 113 it's years ago, right? One of, no, 113, I think. And, uh, but this is how the Syrian and the Sephardic Jewry back then in the 60s, 70s, even the early 80s, Benishai was the only accessible book of Sephardic Halakha. The Yalkut Yosef came later on in history. So back then, that generation, this is how, for those of you who remember, uh, for example, Hacham uh, Shevar used to give Shi'orim on the Benishai, uh, Kobe Suton, Alava Shalom, used to give Shi'orim in the Benishai. The, this great Hachamim from the Syrian uh, congregations in Buenos Aires. So the story was as follows. You know well that in the year 1980, I'll say, oh, thank you, beautiful, thank you. The year 1980, 79, 80, my family moved to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Based on rabbinical guidance, my family settled in a Jewish neighborhood by the name of Bom Retiro. For those who know Sao Paulo, Brazil, there are three major, you from there? Okay, beautiful. Yeah, she's from Brazil also. Uh, 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 right, business. Your, your business, right, beautiful. So you have three oh, neighborhoods. Borretiro, Iginopolis, Jardin America. Those are the three Jewish neighborhoods in Sao Paulo. Back then, the most observant um, Jewish populated neighborhood was Borretiro. Now, Iginopolis became the mega hub for Sephardic Jewry. Very, very good. The Safra Synagogue is there, Mekor Haim is there, and many additional synagogues. So the whole Jewish community moved to Egenopolis. But back then, Egenopolis wasn't what it was, what it is today. So we settled in a neighborhood called Bom Retiro. So there were no Sephardic synagogues, and I don't think there was any Sephardic people back then in that neighborhood which is a very commercialized area. Like the onset of San Pablo is in Buenos Aires, right? East side, the Chinatown, so to speak, or east side is in New York City. Or Koreans. Or, yes, Korean, right now, or Koreanos, yes. So we pray in a Hasidic synagogue made up by survivors of the Holocaust. All the members of that shul had some connection to the Holocaust. By the way, that was the first time in my life that I saw someone who survived the Holocaust. I heard of the Holocaust as a child. But in our circles in Argentina, we didn't see it. But in San Pablo, I saw it almost daily in the synagogue. Every time they pull the sleeve to put on the tefillin, you see the numbers in gray. The tattoo. The, right. Now, I went to the mikveh, I see the numbers in gray. And this is how they survived the Holocaust. Somehow Brazil welcomed them, and they settled in Sao Paulo. Now, why do I give you this introduction? Because the official language of the synagogue was Yiddish, no Portuguese. No English, no Hebrew, no Spanish. Announcements, aliyot, derashot, saudot, anything related to the synagogue in Yiddish. I'm telling you, it was a Hasidic type of synagogue from all groups. You have Satmer, Vishnitz, Pupe, Gur, Lubavitch, Litvish, whatever group of Judaism existed then, that's what they had. And the most beautiful part of it is that there was no mahloket in the synagogue. Usually, when you have many different types of backgrounds of people in the synagogue, God forbid, sometimes one person wants to push their tradition, another person wants to push their tradition, and guess what? Many times that ends up in mahloket, right? Big we discussed this the other day without saying names. You know, somebody applied for a position 
to a certain synagogue. And the first question was asked is, how thick is your skin? How thick is your skin? Without going into details, not to put them on the spot. No worries, not here, relax. Here we have zero tolerance for bullying or for attitudes. Baruch Hashem. In the Shem Shemaim, please. So, we did not speak Yiddish at all. My father, probably with another fellow, back then, were the only two or three people in the synagogue that were clean shaven. Everybody, beard, peot, streimels, white socks, black socks, spodics, you name it, they had it. <laughs> suddenly, push. suddenly, one day, an Israeli backpacker comes to the synagogue in Sao Paulo. Just to give you a background, the backpackers are also called in Spanish mochileros. What they do? They finish the Israeli army. After three years, they go on a journey through the world, many times to find spirituality. That's why they go to Tibet, Thailand, Japan, India, Argentina, known Guatemala, today in Guatemala, today, not yesterday, Guatemala, Peru, Ecuador, has Chabar houses in the middle of the jungle, yep. in the middle of the mountain that for Israelis, all in Hebrew. Why? Because they ventured to go through travel after the three years of the army and the most beautiful part of it is that many of these young men and women do Teshuvah through these journeys. It's unbelievable. As we say in the past, Yerida le Sorech Aliyah. You go down and then you come up. So to make a long story short, this backpacker comes into the Hasidic synagogue. He starts talking in Hebrew. Nobody understands him. Hasidim, you know, that they don't really speak Hebrew. So they say, Mashema, Ani Sefaradi, Shemi, Moshe, Cohen, for example. Okay, ah, Sefaradi, one second. Uh, Don David, David, that's my father. Uh, please, take care of him. Okay, my father speaks to the fellow in Hebrew, and he says, I came, uh, I was a victim of a crime. They stole my passport. They stole my ticket. I need to go back to Israel. Okay, my father spoke to the Gabai of the Minyan. The Gabai made an announcement. We need to collect to buy a one-way ticket and give him some pocket money to an Israeli fellow. Let's put the money together. In a few minutes, they cover the cost of the ticket. Baruch Hashem, beautiful. The young man says, to my father, don't worry, I'm gonna send you the money back. My father said, okay, thank you. My father says to the goodbye, he says that he's gonna send the money back. Two weeks later, my father gets a letter in my home, in San Pablo, and it says, Mr. David, please, I want you to post this letter in the synagogue, how grateful I am to everyone that participated for my ticket, and when I have the possibility, I'll send you the money back. So far, so good? Beautiful. Okay, the Kahal reads the letter, and many of them say, Bahalom Alayla. You know? <laughs> yani, okay, good intention. Guess what? Six months later, my father gets an envelope through a Shalia in San Pablo from this fellow. And it says, Don David, I have this money that you sent me for the ticket, plus I'd like to give to the congregation <coughs> for helping me in my moment of need. We don't understand this. I ask you a question. Are you following the news? What's happening in Afghanistan? How many people are stranded? And they have no way of getting out. We will follow. Hopefully they live soon through a third country. But there is a lot of drama going on. Imagine yourself, you're driving to the airport, the Taliban stabs you. 
The Taliban doesn't let you go through. They send you back or they capture you. It depends who you are. You may be a high valuable asset. If you're an American citizen, British citizen, or I don't want to say Israeli because I don't think they're Israelis. Probably they are, but undercover. Okay, that's a whole different show. They can talk about it publicly for security reasons. But bottom line, bottom line is scary. So imagine yourself, you're an Israeli soldier, 21 years old, in a strange land that you don't speak the language. And a, a city, uh, Sao Paulo, unfortunately to say this, but crime, it's, it's regretfully very common. You know, the first thing my mother told me when I got to Brazil a few months ago, don't use the cell phone on the street. Keep it in your pocket. Right? Right. Has Shalom. You know, we should never experience such a thing. But can you imagine? So you go back 1990, 1980, Mechila. So my father comes to the Gabai and he said, what do we do with the money? We don't know who gave. So they spoke to the Dayan of the city. And the Dayan's ruling was because the money was given to help someone, so the money should be used to help people. Okay, now, okay, to help people, what does it mean? So to make a long story short, the Dayan said to my father, since you were the one who coordinated and collected and received, it's upon you to coordinate a community program to help the people. How is the name of that program? Ozer Dalim. Ozer Dalim, very common name in the Sephardic world. That means to help the destitute. So started back then, 1980, 1981, as food packages in honor of the holidays. And for many years, me, myself, and I, with my siblings and kids of the synagogue, we used to deliver food packages in honor of the holiday, etc. This program is going on till today, but grew so much that there are 10 members involved several months of the year, and every holiday they select different synagogues where to create like a warehouse for needy people to collect, to pick up garments, and to do like shop, supermarket shopping in order to benefit them for their needs in honor of the holiday. How long ago this happened? The early 80s. Till today, is going. So my father, Allah Shalom, gets direct deposit. Mm -hmm. Besides what the family does. And this is what the Pasuk says, Hazorim, you know, you plant, you plant, and you don't know where the outcome and the good result uh, will be. I can tell you a lot of stories, but if I'm gonna tell you stories, I'm not gonna tell you lessons of the Benish Chai. But I think it gives you a bit of a message or understanding what type of person was he, Baruch Hashem. And uh, we follow, the entire family follows in the footsteps uh, of being kind, of connecting to the Hachamim, and uh, go above and beyond. I'll tell you one more thing. He was not afraid of growing up spiritually. Some people spiritually get stuck in time. I never heard of this. I never learned it. I never did it. It's too late. The opposite. In my home, we knew the following. Whatever we learned, whatever we heard, it became part of our life most of the time. And although sometimes it was not easy, but as I said before, once you have a muna in the hachamim, once you love the Torah, you know, somebody told me the other day, I'm going to send you a picture. Is it a picture of what? Your father, somebody told me the other day, I didn't know this. He didn't, uh, uh, he didn't publicize a lot of the things that he did quietly. It says, your father, 10 years ago, he sponsored a classroom in a synagogue. They said they were looking for sponsors. They said, what do you have available? I, have, I need a classroom for Torah classes. OK, go ahead. I'll pick up the tab. You know, the varim that were done beset, and we only knew this afterwards. 
after my father passed away, alayhi shalom, there were several times that people came to my home in Brazil and gave my mother money. And my mother says, Baruch Hashem, I'm okay, I don't need. It says, no, 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 this money was loaned to me by your husband. And he told me, whenever you have money to pay, pay back. I'm not going to tell you how much was paid back, because I don't have the final figure. But there were a couple of figures, without going too much into details. There is such a concept, Shalom Melech says, Matan Baseter. Have you heard of this concept? Matan Baseter, in many, right, Matan Baseter is a name utilized by many charity institutions because there is a great zechut when a person gives tzedakah quietly. Matam baseter ichfe af. Shalom HaMelech says, giving charity quietly has so, is so powerful that it's able to, reach, to, to cause God's anger for the day to retrieve. This is the power of matan baseter. Uh, let's take advantage that the Benish Hai is with us today in the book and in the spirit. And let's learn a few minutes concerning the introduction to today's Perasha, Perashat Nisabim. Perashat Nisabim is Perasha that is always read before Rosh Hashanah. Atem Nisabim Hayom Kulechem literally means you are all standing in front and comes the Targum Unkelos and it says, Atem Nitzavim Ayom Yoma Den, the day of judgment. Who is standing in front of God in the day of judgment? The leaders, the tribes, the elders, the officers, every man, every woman, every child, everybody stands in front of a Kadosh Baruchu. So comes the Zora Kadosh. And he brings a fascinating pasuk that says, Ki karov elecha hadavar me'od, beficha ubilbabecha la'asoto. Translation, it means, the matter is very close to you. Beficha in your mouth, bilbabecha in your heart, la'asoto, to do it. This is, by the way, the foundation of the book of the Tanya. The Balatanya, who wrote this sefer, is based on this particular pasuk. And the Benishai explains, when the pasuk says davar, davar, the matter, what exactly is the Torah referring to? So there are a few answers to this question. One answer is Shabbat. The importance of Shabbat at all levels of action, of speech, and thought. Why davar is Shabbat? The Pasuk says, Mi meso hefsecha bedaber davar. That's one opinion. Second opinion, says the Benish Hai, refers to the gift of Teshuvah. The Teshuvah is an all-encompassing concept. And yet, for those who were here last week, we discussed how Shabbat and Teshuvah are connected. The root word, of Teshuvah is Shabbat, Tav Shin Bet. And Shabbat is Shin Bet Tav. It's the same letters. So through the Zechut of Shabbat observance, the person enhances part of the Kedusha of the uh, Shabbat. Comes the Benish Hai, and he brings a fascinating Hiddush. The Pasuk says, Beficha Ubilbabecha with your lips and your heart. What's the root word of the word picha? Pe, mouth. Bilbabecha, lev. So says the Benishai, if you take the word pe and lev, and you spell the letters pe, it will be pe, he, and he is he, aleph, and le, lamed is lamed, mem, dalet, and bet is bet your taf, is going to give you gematria shofar. Wow. 
You like it? I didn't say it. The Rabbi Shai said it. I'm a mouthpiece only. I'm only moving my lips. That's what the Rabbi Shai says. The Ramos, they taught at the Shubah. It says that the Shofar awakens us to improve. And where do we learn this message? Says the Ben Ishai, says the Midrash Rabbah. God says to the Jewish people, Shaperu Ma'asechem. What's the meaning of the word Shaperu? Leishtaper. What's the meaning of Hebrew Leishtaper? Improvement. Improve your deeds, says God to the Jewish people. And the reminder, he says, of Benishai is the mitzvah of the shofar. No, so far. Shofar. So far, so good. Comes the Benishai and it says, Sheshteshuba serikha liot bape ubalev beyahad belo dafka bape. He says, the Benishai, many times. When it comes to do Teshuvah, we do Teshuvah from the lips. But we don't do Teshuvah internally. In other words, God, forgive me, I will not do it again. But internally, we didn't check that in yet. It's still on hold. So it says the Benishai, the Shofar reminds us that the Pe and the Lev needs to be connected, needs to be united. And not only that, for example, the shofar, where the shofar comes from? The ram's horn, right? Why specifically we are selective that the shofar should come from a ram? What if it comes from a cow? You will not find shofarot from a cow. You will find shofarot from the ram. The ram is a strong animal, strong physically. And it says the Ben Ishai that the Torah is hinting to us that as long as the person's body and mind is strong, the gates of Teshuvah are open. You don't have to wait to do Teshuvah till you're retired. The younger you do Teshuvah is the better. And for that reason, remember yesterday or the day before, we discussed the shape of the Lulav. How is the Lulav? Bend it. And how is the Lulav? Begins from a narrow mouth and goes to a white the mouth. Shofar. Shofar. The shofar, right. What did I say? Oh, I was trying to see if you're listening. Okay, you're listening, right? Actually, the lulav is connected to the shofar. If you want to know the reason, lo lev, lev. The lev of the lulav is the lev of the shofar. I will discuss some of the time how it's connected. With, they are connected, by the way. Now, let's continue. The shofar is bended. Why bend it? Because bending flexibility is important in life. If a person stiff like a rod, you will not make it in life. Physically, financially, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. You need to have flexibility. You know, your body, you want your body to be flexible, right? You want to be able to move your hands, your fingers, your elbow, your legs, your neck, right? It says the Ben Ishai that this flexibility reminds us of Teshuvah. It says because what Teshuvah literally means. Teshuvah means I need to change. And that's why the great Rabbeinu Yonah in Sha'are Teshuvah writes three words. Heavy. Akshan Teshuvato Kasha. Translation. A person that is stubborn, Teshuvah is very difficult. Why? Because action means what? Stubborn. A person that is not willing to be flexible. A person that is not willing to bend. A person that is not willing to take a step back. Remember a few weeks ago, we discussed the Amida class the final line of the Amidah, when we finish the Amidah after everything else, what do we say? I'll say Shalom. Excellent. And what the Arachah says? When you say I'll say Shalom, 
you take three steps back. You move to the left. You move to the right, and you bend to the center. Why that motion? It says because for peace, you need to take a step back. If you need to bend to the left, if you need to bend to the right, and if you need to bend to the center, all of those movements are justified in order to preserve the peace. That's why we take the three steps back. Besides saying, thank you, Hashem, and when you turn, you don't, you, when you leave God, you don't give him your back. But that's a different reason. But from a halachic perspective, the lesson in the bending of the Osei Shalom is that for peace, you need to be flexible. Says the Ben Ishai, not only for peace you need to be flexible, you need to be flexible to be able to do Teshuvah. Because what Teshuvah really means? Teshuvah, you know what it means? I need to change. That's what Teshuvah means. Teshuvah means I recognize the need to change. I made a mistake, I have to change. Somebody that is action, somebody that is stubborn, you know, his entire essence is what? My way or the highway. Has shalom. I hope no one carries that ID card in your wallet. Because if you do that, you better apply for a new one. Changing the personality. And that's the Benish High calls the Shala HaKadosh. That it says that for a person to do Teshuvah, the person needs to have the willingness of recognizing the need to change and executing the change as well. What a beautiful uh, introduction that the Benish High says. But it goes one more short paragraph, and then we'll let you go, since many of us need to attend the Berit Mila in a few minutes. So it says as follows. The shape of the shofar begins very narrow. That's where you place your lips to blow the shofar. And it finishes up very wide opening. It says that is the ways of Teshuvah. You don't start Teshuvah from the penthouse. <coughs> You start the Teshuvah from the lobby. You start from the basics. Don't start asking, can I work on Rabbeinu Tam? No, first put on Rashi. Put on the regular Tefillin. And treat it with holiness, with respect, and then you grow. So it says, the part of the Teshuvah is, Mosif veholech la'avodat Hashem. It is part of Teshuvah. It's not that a person must become the Sadiq, which Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, I believe, I don't think we read it yet, and I'm not sure that we're going to be able to read it because now Rosh Hashanah is getting closer and we need to activate between Sunday and Monday and maybe tomorrow some of the Alachot of Rosh Hashanah. But I'm going to tell you some good news that for the protocol of Teshuvah to be activated, you don't need to give a 25% down payment like in a mortgage. In a mortgage, the more you give as a down payment, the less will be the monthly payment. And I tell you from professional experience that sometimes the, the, if the person has a low credit, but it gives a nice down payment, they're willing to work with a person with a higher interest rate. And the better your credit, the lower the down payment. But irrelevant of how much you're gonna give, a down payment needs to be something. What, 10%, 15%, 18%? You're the real estate business, right? Sounds good, 18%? 20%. 20% is more realistic, right? But what if I wanna give 1% down? They don't even gonna look at you. Forget it. They don't even gonna process your application. Correct? Why? Because it's not meaningful. One percent is how much? Let's say the unit cost 
condominium average price today? 500, let's say? 5,000. So big deal. But if you put 50,000, oh, a receipt. We can talk. And if it's 75,000, not better, as they say in Arabic. Better. And if you give 100,000, oh, what coffee do you like, right? I'm going to tell you a secret. For teshuva activation, you don't need even 1%. You don't need 1%. And I use the number just for illustration purposes. You know what God says? Bitholi petah kehuto shel mahat. Open for me like the eye of a needle. Minimum. One step towards a kadosh baruchu. Activation. Like you play Monopoly. What happens? When you go to the circle in Monopoly, you come back, right? You get $200, right? I don't, I don't remember the name of that step. $200 for pass and go. Uh, pass and go, thank you. Pass and go, collect 200 Monopoly dollars. I knew it, it wasn't too far. Okay, pass and go and collect. Sometimes you get a penalty. And sometimes you get a, a get out of jail card. So the Shuba is get out of jail card. And opening the teshuva, starting the teshuva, is pass and go and collect. That's what Rabbi Moshe Cordovero said. He did not speak about monopoly, for the record. I'm throwing in the monopoly, just for us to understand it better. He says that the moment that a person puts in his mind, or her mind, because teshuva is, is uniform for everybody, it says, Borei Olam, Hazak and that is the reason why I will finish with this. The Zohar Kadosh discusses part of the prayers. And after the Amidah, what do we say? Tahanun. Anna. Ashabnu, Bagadnu, Gazanu, Dibarnu Dofi, Belashon Ara. The whole ABC of uh, Vituri. And the Zohar Kadosh asks the following question Why? Do we have Tahanun immediately after the Amida? You know what the Zohar Kadosh is? That after the person prays the Amida, Shamayim collects all of our prayers. You know, like every person has an account, and every person has a file, and every person has a social security number. So in Shamayim, every person has their own account. And what happens with that account? <coughs> All our prayers go to that account. And at the end of the tefillah, the printout comes out. And it says, this is the prayer that Yosef requested today. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. OK, we need to get an approval. Who are you going to give it to? To the malachim in charge of the application. But guess what? These malachim, they put your request into the system. And they say, hold on a minute. This person doesn't deserve none of these blessings. Because look at the actions of yesterday. So when he comes and asks for so many things, God says, don't worry. I know what he did. Because he told me what he did. When did we tell God what we did? Ashabnu, Bagadnu, Gazanu, Ibadnu Dofi, He'ebinu, Ve'inshamu, Zadnu, Hamasnu. All these words that we say is our confession to a Kadosh Baruch Hu. It says by the time the Malachim finish scrutinizing all that, God already has the delivery of the Bidui, and therefore, they are able to grant us many of our wishes. But, as the Benish Hai says, it cannot be beficha. That's why when you say, Anna, what, where, do you, where do you hit yourself? In your heart. Why? Because pe bilvad is not enough. It has to be pe and lev. Be 
אותיות שופר. This is the initial message of the British High of today in this week's Torah portion. Very neither time allowing, we'll try to continue. May that sound that the words of Torah elevate the neshama of Doret Batsofi, alayhi shalom, and your wife Simha, Rachel Bat Haya, and also my father uh, David Ben Esther, that today is the day of the Askara. So we're going to say Rabbi Hanania and Kaddish Al Israel. Baruch Adonai Ya'olam, Amen ve Amen. Rabbi Hanania ve Nakashia Omer, Ratsha Kadosh Baruchu, Lezakot et Israel. Lefichach, Irvala Hem Torah Mizvot Shere Emar, Adonai Hafez Lema.